Today's episode is brought to you by Mack Weldon. With a smart design, premium fabrics, and a simple shopping experience, Mack Weldon underwear is definitely better than whatever Sandor Clegane is currently wearing. In addition to looking and feeling great, all Mack Weldon products are crafted with natural fibers that have built-in performance capabilities, so they work hard too. They even have a line of silver underwear and shirts that are naturally antimicrobial, which means they eliminate odor and definitely do not protect against dragon fire. All that and they're shipped right to your door. Go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off your purchase using promo code OWNS. growl right now, but I don't have it on me. But... <laughs> you don't keep a sound bake on your phone at all times, just in case. You know what? I have the Drogon. I have Drogon as my uh, uh, ringtone. Someone really? Call Paul Fairfield. <laughs> <laughs> it scares the shit out of me every time it goes off. I'm is like, it? what? Which one is it exactly, though? Because there's a couple Drogons. Huh? There's a couple different Drogon sounds. Which one is it? Which one did you it's pick? The, it's the it's the legendary cry. You know, the one that's. Mm -hmm. I should. Well, I put, I put my phone, I left my phone out back on. Something's me. happening. What's happening? You should be able to figure this out for us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's record it. <laughs> um, do you use it as your alarm in the morning when you wake up? Because <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> Nothing's going to get you out of that, bed that's like a dragon. That's a good idea. I, should do that. yeah. I think uh, this is a very biased thing to say. I'm going to say it anyway. You're the person I've been most excited to talk to on the stage this week. Oh. And if my friend David Peterson heard me say that, he might get a little jealous. But <laughs> he's also a big fan of yours. So oh, he's awesome. looking forward to hanging out with Thank you. Thanks for coming. So much. Thank you for inviting me. So much. It's it. so awesome to be here. It really is. I work, I work mostly by myself in a very dark room. Mm -hmm. So to, it's true. And, and to come and see, you know, see everybody here, all the fan base, and to be able to connect is really great for me. I mean, I, I have, I'm smack in the middle of the season seven right now, and I have to go back with to do such an incredible amount of work over the next few weeks, and I feel like it's completely energized by this convention and feel like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's really true, you know, I, I wanna say something, I don't know how many people have said this, but I wanna say this to you that you know, the, everybody who works on this show loves this show as much as you do. And it's really, um, it, it is like a village, you know? And, and the other thing about it is that kudos to all of you for your support and, and like crazy support um, because what happens is, you know, Hollywood and all that is all based on money. You know, it all really comes down to that. But when the fan support is so great, the purse strings slowly open, and you will not be disappointed this season. It is. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> no, it is. You can't even imagine what's about to happen. I, I am so excited for you all to see this season. So it, what happens? Yeah, you're oh just gonna. Oh my God. Can you tell us? <laughs> Can we no, just come I, out and say well, it? Well, we I, I would have to kill you. The dragons would come in and burn you. All you just hold up your phone when someone calls you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you know, People ask, oh, what's going to happen? But you, you don't want to know. I mean, you want to see the beautiful yeah. flower that is Game of Thrones unfold before your eyes. And, and you, I mean, I, every season I, I, I'm amazed that they can outdo themselves. But mm -hmm. this is, I mean, I, well. Is it your favorite one so far? Oh, oh man. <laughs> well, oh, even man. from the trailers, I mean, we know that you do a lot of work with the dragon sounds. And even from just the trailer, they're so heavy on these huge, spectacular moments that, and you know, those are two-minute snippets that we're getting of, of what's about to come. Oh, so. yeah. It's the, the dragons, you know, the interesting thing about the dragons, you know, they're very... Visual effects wise, they're incredibly expensive, as you can imagine, the, the, the amazing detail. I mean, the detail in the visual effects inspires me so much. Mm -hmm. All the nuances that they put, and I match it sonically. 
And, but, but the thing about it is, is that, um, you know, you look, I, it's funny, I, I looked, I came on in season three, and that's sort of when the dragons were toddlers and then have grown since. So, but I was looking at season three, a, a clip from a, a 304, which is when she it looks like she's going to sell off Drogon, that sequence. And uh, I was amazed, I hadn't looked at it for a long time, I was amazed how far we've come. But the other thing about it is that, the dragon shots are parsed out every year. You know, they can only afford so many because they're mm -hmm. so incredibly expensive, but not so much this year. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling out all the stops. Yeah, they are. Yeah, and I can only imagine the, the finale year. Oh my God, oh, uh, you know, I don't know what they're cooking up. Because oh. I never know until, Game of Thrones is unique in the sense that we get, I get the entire season at the beginning of the season, okay? Most TV, I've worked on many TV shows and, and it's never like that. So they really do treat it like a gigantic, you know, feature film, mm -hmm. like 10 hour feature film. And by the way, though you're only getting seven episodes this year, you're almost getting nine, nine episodes worth of material. I don't know if you've seen the running times, but mm -hmm. the finale is 82 minutes long. So yeah. it's, and they are saying that in the finale season, the six shows could be upwards of feature length, each and every one of them. So it's. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> so we're stressed about like yeah, running out of time. But, uh -huh. <laughs> 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 um, can you talk to us about where, like, how, what do you start with with the season, and kind of how do you begin the creative process of adding layers of or bringing the show to life? Essentially, really, is is what you're doing. And well, kind it's, of how it's that works. Be because because they do t treat it as this long feature. Um, there are arcs, uh, story arcs. Mm -hmm. So the dragons have a story arc. The White Walkers have a story arc. So I treat each one of those individually. I've got separate sessions. I also. Has the drag one very unique sound design feature I've never encountered is that the sound design has to grow up every year. Um, that is something unique with this with the dragons. Okay, that's something I've never encountered before. So when I got them, they were toddlers, and if you listen from, you know, season three t to now. What has to happen is you know the sounds and the movements and everything have to match. Their, their growing size, but must retain uh, an element of their, you know what I mean, must retain mm -hmm. that, that, so you recognize, you know, there's a call of Drogon, which is the one, which is, as soon as you hear it, you know they're around. And mm -hmm. that's, that, you know, it's like the, the that's the, that's, that has been the challenge, to maintain some of the essence of it, their personality, but to make them bigger, 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 bigger. So part, part of it is that, um, plotting that out. Um, it has to do with taking um, some of the original elements, pitching them down, stretching them, pushing them, and then bringing in new things as they grow, new new parts of their personality, mm -hmm. shall we say. So are you, are you like stacking layers and then <coughs> are you literally stretching them and changing the tone of them? I am. And I work, it's very, for anybody who works in sound, the normal or normal, uh, you know, everybody works at 48K, that's, that's how, you know, that's, you know, when, you're, when they're producing a show, that's what it's mastered in. And I work at 96K, so I'm working at double resolution. So I can pitch and stretch before, you know, quite a bit before the sound starts to fall apart because it will start to pixelate in a way. I mean, that would be the visual correlation with it. And that is not a nice sound. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and the thing was is that um, for this season, for instance, Last season, the dragons were pretty damn big, you know, and I, as I s looked at this season and the amount, the sheer amount of dragonness in the season, wow. um, and how, you know, because I have another thing that I have to deal with always, is the score. It's mm -hmm. the endless battle of music and sound, because, and I, don't get me wrong, Ramin's score is one of the most extraordinary ever, and... Yeah, and how fucked up is it, excuse my language, that, that that guy has never been nominated for an Emmy? Yeah, yeah. What the heck? I mean, his score is so iconic. How many times has it been reproduced and, and spoofed off and riffed off and mm -hmm. stuff? And that's crazy. But 
His score is very, very intense. You know, he started last year, he started to use choral stuff, and that occupies a lot of sonic space, and it's very hard. And of course, you know, it's the endless battle. Um, because we occupy, you know, we're all in the sonic fear, you know, it's so it's, um, it, it is, the, the hard part for me is that I have to articulate absolutely every detail, okay, I can't, I can't skip anything thinking, oh, music is going to plow through mm -hmm. that. Because the second I skip over that, that's the spot that will be bare, you know? And so it's, it's hard. It's hard on me. I mean, I will say that, you know, I always say to sound design uh, uh, peeps when I'm, you know, if I'm doing a class or something, you know, enjoy that moment, that last moment when you send it off to the stage. It's the last time you'll hear it that way. And it's spectacular. I sit alone in my room flying on dragons and having a great time, and then off, off they go. Um, so this season because they're so large i was i had to think h how to deal with the body movements for instance and the wings just the mm -hmm. wings alone well, how how because if i pitch everything down now we're going into the lower lower registers and music also is going to be very yeah. low end right. and the potential for all that material to disappear is very great so these are the kinds of things I have to keep in mind. So I have to find other elements to place on top and play. Um, so this season with the dragons, I, I debated. Other seasons I've been able to pitch and stretch a bit and then add a little sweetener. This season I completely re-engineered all the wings, the body movements and everything so completely really so that they will pop, you know, they'll pop, they'll, you know, there's interesting stuff to articulate movement even when the music is blasting through because otherwise you're going to lose that sensuality, that connection with the, the dragon's body that starts to make, it's like you can reach out and touch it, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, I don't want to lose that quality, but it's very, very hard. So that's one of my challenges that I have to deal with just, just in the dragons. And again, with the vocalizations, you know, um, the, the guy who's our post producer is, is, a, is a guy who always pushes me one step farther and I, while I buck at it in the moment, I always appreciate it after. He's, you know, because our conversations had been at the beginning when I started this, you know, it's sort of like when you go, you know, if you go to a zoo or something and you expect to hear the lions roar and the, you know, the, the, the elephant's trumpet and, you know, whatever, but it's those beautiful little sounds that they make in between that you don't expect, that, that makes you lean in. You know what I mean? That it's like, oh, I didn't know that that, that made that sound. You mm -hmm. know, the beautiful chitters or trills or chuffs or whatever, and that's the stuff I search for, you know? Ti and and the, my style is tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces of things. So it's, it's really like a huge jigsaw puzzle. By this point, by the way, this season, there's probably no less than two dozen animals that are mixed in with these to create now the full vocal of the dragons. Wow. So each year, I've added more and more pieces. And, um, and one of my favorite ones is uh, some of the more intimate scenes. Now, the intimate scenes are very difficult because there's no music to hide behind, there's no anything to hide behind. There's no battles, there's no you know, crazy shit going on. <laughs> it is just bare ass. So the scene with um, Tyrion and the dragons, when he, you know, that scene was very, very difficult because it's all articulated, it's all there's time. No music for that? Well, there's some music, but it's, it's not, it's very quiet music because it's right. a quiet yeah. scene, right? So everything, everything plays and that's, you think I wouldn't be so after bitching about the fact that everything gets? Yeah, <laughs> I do love them, but it's it's very it, it, it it's they're awesome. very tricky. Yeah. But um, you know, the first really big ass in, intimate scene between Khaleesi and Drogon um, uh, is 502 when he's been missing for a while, and mm -hmm. he comes flying down off. He lands on the top of the castle and comes down to see her in that very intimate thing. And for instance, in that scene, I wanted to find something that you really, you got their tenderness. I mean, this is a beast that could swallow her with one, you know, one sniff and she'd be gone. And um, 
And so my dog, I ha I, my dog, unfortunately, who has been my, my kind of muse and has provided a lot of the vocals for the wolves, you can thank oh Angel gosh. for your voice. That was amazing. Um, she was my little dragon, and she's a Belgian Malinois crazy girl. And but she had the idea came to me because she was so nutty. She was like a very powerful, you know, kind of a working dog, police dog style. You know, we trained for years. We did that. We were we were best buds. And this crazy dog would come up to me. And in our very kind of most tender moments, there was this beautiful little tiny nasal whistle that was half cry, half, you know? And that sound became Drogon's sound. If you listen oh, to wow. that scene, That's so sweet. you'll hear that. But, and I will tell you that, you know, I love Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones has been, I always laugh because I will tell you that every single scene that I've ever done has something very personal for me in it. That's, That's cool. where I work from. Um, and uh, so all of these things, that's my story. That's my fun in my room by myself. I have so many stories about every single scene and it's, it's been extra, it's like the best therapy ever. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna ask, cause you're talking about all these different animals, animal sounds that are layered on top of each other and you're talking about your dog, which is so sweet, but where else do you draw inspiration from and kind of figure out, especially with these mythical creatures that you can't go and sit at a zoo, you know, and listen to uh, their, their movement and their sound. Can you talk a little bit more about other places that you've drawn inspiration from? Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. It's, um, you know, my style of working, I don't use any synthetic sound whatsoever. Okay, it was all organic. It all comes from Earth because my theory of it is that you know, if you use something that is not, that does not have a soul, that the sound that you produce will never have a soul. You cannot capture, you can't put a soul into something that has nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So every single sound has that. And I, and I guess I go through and track sort of, I mean, I don't do it formally, but in my mind tracks certain emotional things and then pull from that. But yeah, I, I mean, I search, I, I'll spend hours and hours and hours listening to sounds, you know, animal sounds, whatever, uh, depending, you know, the White Walkers, for instance, are a completely different deal. I mean, that, that was an interesting, a whole interesting curve because I came on in season three. So the White Walkers were introduced at the end of season two. And the idea behind that though, was that um, David, who was here, was talking about languages and he created a f entire language for I was ask you about yeah. that yeah he he created an entire language called scroth um, so that was sort of when I came on that was kind of the idea and they had tried it at the end of real uh, at the end of uh, episode two but didn't get real deep into it um, and I came on and we started we tried a couple of things and and the first scene was when um, when Samuel kills uh, the White Walker, that scene when he makes that appearance. So that was the first kind of big one that we were dealing with. And um, you know, it, it occurred to me partway through that, that in some regards, these mythical beings were just above, beyond language. I mean, it, it, was de it almost was demeaning to them to speak, you know? And so I, so I kind of came up with the idea that as he moved through the forest in that scene, you know, you start to see him and he's approaching them, um, that everything in his path was freezing, that he was so cold and then in command almost of those forces to a extent, although that's not revealed until the Night Kings, but that he would move and freeze everything. And that was extended to the arrival of the Night King, that, that um, they command the forces of nature. So you hear them, their arrival is always announced by something that feels like the earth could crack and fold into. You know, he, they command that they can crack the earth, they can ripple the mountains, they can, they are in command of those forces and it makes them omnipotent. It makes them absolutely powerful and in a, this quiet way, you know, they stand and you just, you know, they're icy, they're icy blue eyes, you know, so it was an interesting thing to play with and it's worked very well. By the time we got to Hard Home, it was, I mean, that was, it became epic and a, and a very good way to move. I mean, it's funny how your instincts will, will work out and, and that's a lot of what 
Game of Thrones is about because I didn't know what's going to go, ha like I have no idea what's going to happen in season eight. I know season seven. I know everything about season seven, but I have no idea what's coming, and I don't know till the beginning of the season. And I will tell you when I when I get the show, it's very rough. There's a lot of animation still, you know, because the VFX aren't done. But I'll tell you when I watch this season, I swear to God, I had like. 13 near heart attacks. I was crying inconsolably <laughs> twice. And I couldn't like breathe for about half an hour after. It was, it's crazy, you know. And I get, because I get that wrapped up emotionally in the stuff. And, and it has, you know, it, it, it's all of those elements in, 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 in Thrones, it's, it's like, it, they're just so, you know, the wolves too. I mean, the wolves have been an amazing thing. I mean, I've done all the dire wolf stuff. And there's some, there's, a beautiful scene this season that I'm very proud of and I called it my love letter to Angel because she passed just before the new year and she is the source of voice for the entire scene which is really awesome but that's my that's my special stuff that I do and it's not necessarily known but the cool thing is because I think because I'm shooting from the heart always what, what is really empowering for me is when someone says, I can't believe the dragons aren't real, or that scene, you know, made me cry, or whatever. I mean, you know, that's my way of speaking to each one of you individually. That's my connection to you, and it's what I get back. And when I hear how much everyone loves this show, you can't imagine how important that is for all of us who work on it, how wonderful that is, because, Right now, and now I feel a little emotional saying this, but in this, too, okay. like. <laughs> no, but in this look, in this world where we are right now, which is so scary outside, I mean, it's horrible, right? I mean, it's going on, it's going on all the time. You know, what is, you know, sometimes I think my contribution to the world is, is, is like, I wish I was a teacher or a doctor or a nurse, you know, those people are, they're the true heroes, you know, those, you know, and, and it feels like, you know, Hollywood, I mean, when you're working there, it's, it's, it's not a pretty place. There's a lot of crap that goes on when any place that's so run and, and, and is centered on money, you know, it's, but when I come to a place like this and see the joy and the fun and the cosplay and, and just how much everybody loves it, you know, I realize that this is a, a safe place, a wonderful place for us to dream and literally imagine dragons. And 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 I'm, I I realize in these moments, and thank you for inviting me here, that that it is an important thing, and it is something that that we can all share and dream, and escape this crap shit world that we're sitting in right now, where it's so uncertain. Hell yeah! <laughs> Hell yeah! And you're among friends. You're among friends. Yeah. I was, uh, my mind's blown right now. I don't know. <laughs> just all this, all the White Walker stuff. And well, it's, you know, it's wow. funny. I mean, I, I, will, I will tell you also, um, you know, we're all human who work on this show. And I, I went through some very hard personal stuff. And I, you know, the, the dragon, I, I had lost my sister and my father just before this show happened. Game of Thrones has been an, an absolute gift for me, and I've always said the dragon saved me. My dad passed in, uh, this was in, uh, um, Jesus, uh, July, uh, the end of July 2012, and my sister passed the end of January 2013. And right smack in the middle, I got tapped on the shoulder to join Thrones. And when my sister passed, I spent a month playing with dragons. I didn't see anybody. And the first scene I did was the plaza scene. And the plaza scene has every emotion in it. It has joy, it has anger, it has, you know, all that stuff. It has, it has, you know, the panic of Drogon as she walks away and the crying and the crying out. And then his anger and her anger and him, him um, vindicating her when that, you know, dick was like, you know, dissing her and Valerian. <laughs> and um, for, so for me, I mean, that's, that's, that, you know, it actually has been, I mean, it literally has been this, this place of catharticness, of joy, and it's where whatever I'm feeling goes into my work. And so, you know, and, and that I can say is, is probably the same for a lot of people on the show, you know, and, and, and we all want to do that for you, you know, because it, 
you know, like I'm, I'm so excited about the season and what you are about to see. And I, I you know, it, it, it keeps us going when you guys are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just go, okay, we keep going, keep going, keep going. And, you know, I, I, I just, I'm so stoked for the season. I mean, it's, yeah, it's going to be yeah, awesome. We are, we are too, right? <laughs> I just feel like, <laughs> I mean, I just am like feeling emotional. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> but it's this incredible opportunity that we have to be together and to know that something that we care so much about is also something that the folks who are putting their time oh, yeah. and effort. And I think a lot of us feel here as well that Game of Thrones is our safe haven too. And this is where yeah. we come to play and create and build community. And, and the fact that that's also coming from the people who are working on the show is, it take, is Look, incredible. it takes a village. And we are all a village and a community. And it's really extraordinary, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I will say something else that one of the reasons that Game of Thrones is Game of Thrones or the two creators at the top, Dan and David, are, look, if anyone... If anyone uh, could claim the dickhead, uh, the dickhead award, you know, like if they could claim being dickheads yeah. in Hollywood because throw their weight around and be asses, they actually have earned it. Mm -hmm. You know, not that that's okay, but listen, you know, I can tell you f a million, a million, you know, people in Hollywood who act like that and have no claim to that, but they're not like that. They are. I have never been on a show. Um, that has been created by people, you know, with creators that will talk to, are respectful, and will talk to everybody the same way, whether you're the driver, whether you're a craft service, whether you're the sound person, whether you're the lead actor, whether you're the dragon, I'm sure they talk to the dragons too. And, <laughs> but no, I have never in my life, and because of that, and, and they're so smart and funny, but they're so respectful and enveloping. And you can, I'm sure you've heard stories from the actors of how gracious they are. Yeah, absolutely. That's why. You know, it, it, we all are, you know, I, I want to, I want to find the nuggets and the beauty for all of you and for them too, you know, mm -hmm. to, to bring their vision completely to life because, you know, they're the ones who are driving this. They're the ones who feed me these incredible images of the dragons, of the white walkers, of the wolves, you know, all that stuff. And there is, I think, everybody on this show pushes themselves, you know, five steps farther than what they think they're capable of doing. I mean, by the way, part of my heart attacks watching this season was, oh my God, what the fuck am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like that, you know, the challenge that is set before you, I mean, they, they call, to, call you to step up and push yourself past what you think you're capable of. And because of that, I can say, I am 10 times the sound designer I was when I started on this show, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Do you feel more fulfilled because you're pushing yourself so hard? On oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Does it, does it make a difference that it's so popular and that so many people love it? or? Would... Well, I think the thing is, is that when it's popular and so many love it, then the money stays and comes and comes, and the show expands, expands. And if you, you know, you, you all are fully familiar with the trajectory of this series, you know yourself. It has become more elaborate, more beautiful, more, just so more much stuff going on and visual effects are insane on this show. I mean, there is not a shot that's not touched by visual effects now to, right. to yeah. just pull and every drop of beauty out of every shot. It's, you know? it's like a painting. It is. Yeah. It's like a painting when you watch. I love watching the. Uh, you ever watch the VFX? Like when they do oh, yeah. their VFX yeah, yeah, reels, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and they have these layers and layers, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, there's stuff that I wasn't even realizing that they were doing. Yeah, you know, they, in the backgrounds. And, and they stuff. had a million on that uh, the saddle on the green screen. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of silly, but. Yeah, I was reading about there. The article just came out in Time, and I did. Oh yeah, did you see that cover? Oh. That was ridiculous. And it's kind of what we did here on the opening ceremony when they were dressed in normal clothes. I was like, that's so neat. No, it was so cool, but they were talking about the 40-foot mechanical bull that she's yeah. flying. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow. <laughs> You're like, it's not a bull, actually. It's a pigeon. It's a beaver. Oh, yeah. It's a crocodile. It's an alligator. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's so cool. That must be so fun to be able to approach that, because like when... Like, if we're just going to talk about Game of Thrones, we get to, we get to make the podcast and, and the convention and blah, 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 blah. But to actually be able to sit down and go, all right, well, here's the dragon for Game of Thrones. What am I going to pick? <laughs> oh, I'll use my dog. That's good. Like, I wish I could use my dog for anything. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, well, exactly. See, I get to do that, but but I'm always searching for like cool stuff, like interesting stuff, and I'm I'm you know I've been become obsessed with sonic phenomena of our Earth. You mm -hmm. know, there's many many things. I just um, finished uh, a few months ago the Mist, which is starting to air, and um, you know I became obsessed, for instance, with um, the, the, the concept for the mist, because the mist is about what fear will drive people to the extremes, which, which is, is very apropos. Things. Well, it was, right. it was pitched as such. Right. And um, uh, around that time, I was reading about sonic phenomenon and came across the concepts of the booming sounds. And the booming sounds are um, occur in about 35 sites in the world. One of them happens to be close to my house, in Kelso Dunes in the Mojave. But it's a, it is a, co a special combination of air temperature, uh, uh, angle of the dunes, etc., such that when sand is pushed, um, essentially it's all these tiny pieces of sand under pressure pushing and rubbing against each other that create this moaning sound. It is so insane and it is so haunting. And what a freaking metaphor for, I expanded that to the souls, all the souls and beings under extreme pressure mm -hmm. and the moaning, you know, and so a fear or whatever dread. And so it's stuff like that and I am coming up with this, I guess I'm, I'm going that route because I can't talk about something that I'm doing for this, but... So we go back to Dorn is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it's that kind of idea. I search for those sorts of things. And again, it's all of the earth, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's stuff that's naturally it's occurring. Real. It's yeah. real. And it's, but that's the thing, if you think about it, it's, you know, sand are little tiny pieces of things that have broken off and worn down, down to its tiniest little piece. And when all of them are joined together, the beautiful sound they make, and what a, an extraordinary metaphor yeah. for our world, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, so I love stuff like that. I mean, my background is, I, I don't, I didn't go to film school, I went to art school, and I went to one of the most radical art schools in the world at the time, which was oddly in Nova Scotia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm Canadian. Hey, and to any Canadians here, <laughs> happy Canada Day! <laughs> is that Canada Day? It is. Happy Canada Day. Yeah. Can we get her a cake? <laughs> Can we get all the Canadians a cake? That we're yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, oh shit, I lost my train of thought. Me too. Oh, anyway. <laughs> happy Canada Day. Happy <laughs> Canada Day. Is there, so, huh? Art school, yeah. 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 So yeah, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, which was in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, you know, it was the site of uh, radical feminism, Jungian theory, Jungian Freudian theory, um, socialism, Marxism, and me with a bad perm from a tiny town in Nova Scotia ending up there going like, whoa. Like this was a good idea. <laughs> well, I didn't, yeah, I was completely out of my element initially, but it opened my, opened my world up to so many different things, you know. But I, my background is in, um, you know, alternative narrative structures and conceptualization, and it's what I do very well. And and bringing that to this work, it's just a completely different thing. I had to kind of, I mean, I had been an artist, I exhibited, um, doing video at the time. I mean, I haven't made art in over 20 years, and I'm about to move back to that, which is going to be mm -hmm. fun. I'm going to do some. I want to do a VR piece. I want to do some interactive audio installations and. In fact, one of my big pieces that I want to do is an underwater piece about grief. Because if you think about that as a metaphor, it's a beautiful metaphor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and I realize, for instance, as a sound designer, perhaps I can contribute to the conversation that's been started by Lady Gaga and Prince Harry about mental health and where we're at. Because these, yeah, because these things... Well, these are, these are really important conversations, especially right now, when there's so little to hold on to that's, you know, that's, that's solid, you know? That's a so, lot of noise. That's a lot of noise, ironically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have about 10, 15 minutes left. I was thinking we probably have a million more questions that we yeah. could ask you, but if we wanted to start pulling from the sure. audience and, and yeah. getting a couple questions. Today's show is brought to you by Away. 
Away offers high-quality luggage that is designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel. Available in nine colors and four sizes, including carry-on sizes that are compliant with all major U.S. airlines, the Away suitcase is lightweight and unrivaled in strength and impact resistance. Not to mention, it features a TSA-approved combination-locked four 360-degree spinner wheels and a patent-pending compression system to help over packers. Better yet, Both sizes of the carry-on are able to charge anything that's powered by a USB cord. A single charge will power your iPhone five times. And thanks to Away's lifetime warranty, if anything breaks, they'll fix and replace it for you for life. I've been using the same suitcase for the last eight years, and to finally replace it with something that is lightweight, easy to use, and easy to pull around behind me in the airport has been a game changer. Yes, Hannah's travel was modernized for Game of Thrones, and you can try out Away for 100 days vibe with it, travel with it, Instagram it, and if at any point you decide it's not for you, return it for a full refund. Shipping is free within the lower 48 states, so you've got nothing to lose. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash owns and use promo code owns during checkout. That's awaytravel.com slash O-W-N-S, promo code owns for $20 off your away suitcase. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Picnics, potlucks, dinner parties, barbecues, good food is essential to a successful summer. And now it's easier than ever to create delicious summer meals with Blue Apron. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients right to your door. Yes, today was Blue Apron Day in the Strike and Zach household. We were on hold for traveling last week, but everything worked out because Blue Apron is completely flexible. I can customize my recipes each week and choose a delivery option that fits my needs. And Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Some of the meals available in July include seared chicken and creamy pasta salad with summer squash and sweet peppers, creamy shrimp rolls with quick pickles and sweet potato wedges, fresh basil fettuccine pasta with sweet corn and cubanelle pepper, and chili butter steaks with Parmesan potatoes and spinach. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash owns. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash owns. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. When you are out in the field, do you have a portable device that you use that records at the, I guess, the, the resolution that you want? Like something that's kind of like your go-to? I've always wondered that about sound design. I have, um, I have a full fleet of Zoom audio stuff that I've been yep. using. In fact, now, you like uh, Zoom stuff? last year I started working with Zoom, so oh, I've been really? doing some stuff with them, and they've been incredibly supportive. But, yeah, I have, you know, I'm, I... I have a weird thing right now set up in my studio, 40 pounds of dead animal bones, mm. which there were no animals sacrificed in the <laughs> make. No. Some, I found some dude on Etsy who goes in the desert and, and gathers these things, and I created this gigantic weird chime and shaking and crushing of, you know. what those bones are for. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been... Um, and it's cool because I've been recording like 20 simultaneous tracks right. mm-hmm. with microphones inside bones, inside bottles, hanging. I mean, it's really cool. Yeah, but you have such a fun time. It's ridiculous. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, guys. But, Kim, you okay. can give your name and your question. Uh, my name is Jean, and I was wondering, as interesting as, as it is about the voices of the dragons, what I love about them is the sound of like their wings and the the their wings going through air and then unfurling their wings. Can you talk more about that? What, in terms of what? It, of what you do to create that. Lots of different stuff. And um, it's, you know, you want to kind of, one of the things I do is, is find sonic analogies for stuff, if that makes sense. So one of my weird superpowers, thank God there's a, an application for it is somehow in my brain the ability to deconstruct a sound and reconstruct it with sounds that are completely different so it's so with that I'll take every element the furl the band like in this and I'm in a to- this season in particular because they're so large those sounds are the movements are amplified and, and, and stretched out in a way because it's so big, right? So this one, literally, I have a sound for the lower bang, sound for the upper bang, the push of air down, the push of air up, the, when you've got, 
you know, the edges that, that, that move, so that kind of stuff. And then this season, as you've seen, Drogon has very accentuated thorns that, that, that will ripple. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I used for that, which is really fun. So when you're watching this season, this is a little tidbit, is that I actually use the sound of dragonflies for that. <laughs> Well, I know because I do that. So it's like, hmm, I wonder if I t could do something with the dragonfly so that it's kind of a fun, because now I get to tell you that. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's so cool. But no, it's cool. I mean, it's, it's um, and so it has, you'll hear this kind of like ripple, which is cool because remember I was talking about the music. Okay, trying to beat the music. It's not a high end, it's not a low end sound. It's a high end sound or mid range that you can, that'll cut through and has movement. Um, to, to kind of curl around the score. So it's just stuff like that. But I agree, I mean, for me, the most important thing that makes them almost like you can touch them is their skin mm -hmm. and wings and just the tiny movements. And I love that, that, that stuff too. The coals and stuff, and that's the stuff I probably spend the most time on because it's really detailed and really tough. And the, just the sheer assembly right now, this season, of each wing movement is crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm like assembling over 200 tracks, the dra just the dragons alone. Um, and when I deliver to the stage, I have them mixed down to s like four or five 7.1 stems where they're um, pretty well panned and stuff. They'll take that and then massage it in with the music and whatnot. But that's kind of the process because there's no way there's time for them to go through that. So that's, you know, that's part of the job that I have to do too. But, mm -hmm. but thank you for saying thank that you. because I, I love that too. I lo it's, the, it's the funnest part of them in a way for me. Thank you. Ah, Khaleesi! <laughs> uh, my name is Olivia. Uh, I have so many questions written down to ask you, but I will limit it to two. Um, how would you encourage or advise a young woman such as myself who's in the sound field interested in sound ah. design to get into that? And then my follow-up question to that is, do you do internships slash can I work for you? <laughs> <laughs> you like the desert. <laughs> you like the desert, yeah. Um, I, I do. I love the desert. It's where I grew up, so. <laughs> well, you and you have dragons, so you must be there. Exactly. exactly. I understand. Um, well, first of all, yay. We, okay, here's my thing about women in sound, okay? You know, despite, despite the length of time I've been doing this, I will say that it has not been an easy, it's not been an easy trajectory for me. Um, I've been passed over many times for big stuff. I mean, you know, we're talking about right now like Wonder Woman and, and a woman directing that, okay? There are no women that are given shows like that to supervise. And, and I actually stepped back from supervising because of that. I, I just, it's just like, I wanted to do more challenging work and the only jobs I could get for sound supervising really were uh, mid to low budget. And in fact, someone referred to me as a mid to low budget queen. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, not by choice. We'll but, slide your Emmy. I mean. But it's changing slowly. And I, I think, look, please, I mean, go for it. And any, uh, it's so important. There is a, um, my theory has been for a long time, I mean, regardless of what you feel politically or whatever, there is a, a yin-yang to our world. And there's been a lot of yang and not so much yin, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is that what we have to remember is women and men, their relationship to sound is completely different. Okay, we have a different, women have a different hearing range completely. Our response is, it's very interesting working with my male colleagues and what they will go, whoa, like respond to viscerally or what they can't hear. You know, I love the higher ranges and a lot of times I've got to pull it down because um, there is a sonic range that's, you know, it's just different. We also are wired differently, okay? I mean, in, in the basics of it, you know, the base, base survival place of us, okay, in, in my opinion, is there is, uh, I w well, I was on a panel, okay, this, I'll tell this story, I was on a panel last year with five of my male colleagues and me. And they actually switched my mic out part, part way as they thought it wasn't working, and that wasn't the case. I was just sitting there with my mouth hanging open going, oh my God, because, <laughs> It was really interesting. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but what we need is both, okay? They were really of the, the hunting, gathering kind of sense where it was put st throw stuff against the wall, see what sticks, and then go there. I don't do that at all. 
I tell stories. I have to find the story first. And one of the things that I do well, which I've been talking about, is that I, I, there's a lot of emotional content in my work. And the way women relate to sound, we're wired to because of you know because of raising babies and stuff you know if you want to get to that i mean i'm look i'm a feminist i have no children etc however that is just a part of how we are constructed we are constructed such that we can interpret the emotional content of a sound based on for instance if we take it back to the basics if a child is crying because it's in danger because it wants food or because it's playing we can actually extract that emotional content from the sound, okay? It's a different set of tools. And to me, the most perfect union is when men and women work together because then you've got both. I mean, when I've done many shows on my own and I, and I wish that I had had a male working with me to help with some of that stuff to balance it out, you know? And it's funny because it's like one or the other. When there is a full union, when men and women are working side by side in high-end sound design, we will come up with something very spectacular. And it's the same across the board. You know, this whole, the, the, the imbalance is how, why the world is imbalanced right now. And, and I think in terms of, of where you're at, I mean, you know, you got to start with your own practice, you know, find what gives you joy, find the, find the stuff that, that speaks to you and start. Um, in terms of me as uh, doing interns, I work, I mean, I'm just, just, I'm a girl in the desert in a room with some stuff that makes sounds. I mean, I don't, I don't do that formally. However, I'm happy to keep in contact with you and, and help in That'd however I can. And, and I'm hoping, I mean, Belmont College has said, you know, they may bring me back, et cetera. You know, I'm, I, I hope that I will get the opportunity to talk to more and more men and women. I, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I think that there's been a definite gap that has not served us. Um, you know, you think of a Transformer movie or something, there is no soul to that stuff. There's no heart to it. You know, there's no, you know, and, and, and it's not to say there's not great work going on, it's just that there's something missing. And, and, and if we can balance that out a little, you know, so go for it. Go Thank for you. it. It yeah. means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. And don't be afraid. Uh, come see me after. I'll give you a card. Okay? Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, David. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks, Zach. Uh, so my fascination with sound design dates back to Troy, the movie from 2004, which was actually written by David Benioff, mm -hmm. which is when I knew his name way back when. He was so cool because I loved that movie. But I remember watching the, the uh, you know, DVD extras once upon a time, and I, uh, there was a, a specific sound, they, they were going over how they made the sound, and they were talking about how they uh, made the effect of sun streaming and shimmering on a, on a shield, and how they made that sound on screen, which was like, plates, china spinning mm -hmm. next to each other, and it was just so unique because it's so different than sunlight, you know, shimmering on a shield. And so, I, I, it's such a weird, different sound, so I wonder over the course of your career, whether Game of Thrones or otherwise, what are some of the most bizarre or unique <laughs> places you've pulled uh, for some of the sounds you've designed? Wow. Um... You know, it just depends on, I think, as I've gotten more and more my career, sometimes I get bored with stuff and I'll challenge myself to do weird things. I mean, you know, in The Mist, for instance, you know, there's a creature that's designed from goats, monks, and um, scotch tape, and I kid you not. <laughs> and that was just, I was kind of bored and I wanted to do something different because I hear, you know, imagine, I mean, I'm tuned in to hearing so much, so I get much more bored much faster, mm -hmm. you know? And, I, you know, the thing is, is that, I, you know, that kind of idea of the plate spinning, I mean, that's what I mean when you, you know, there's always, first of all, um, there's the push and the desire to find a sound that no one's ever heard before, or to use it to repurpose something in a way like that. And, and, it's, all about, and it's all about metaphors and analogies for me. You know, so that is a very cool thing because it has the essence of it, but it also has life. It also has life because that could have been done with a synthesized thing or something, and, and in other places it might. 
but it has, it has a place. And the thing is you will, there's something about it that though you don't know that it's plate spinning, there's something familiar about it. There's yeah. something oddly familiar. And that's what I mean by real sounds, real organic sounds that maintain their essence, you know. I mean, I, I have f spoken about this before and one of the funny things was, uh, what kind of launched me in my Game of Thrones family was trying to find the special bit for Drogon initially. And um, I remember going in and, and I had prepared that sequence. It was the plaza scene and um, I was so proud of it. I thought, oh, I nailed it, man. I, this is... <laughs> yeah, but... No, no, no. However, I presented it and, and Greg Spence, who is, he runs our post. I mean, he's the crazy brain behind how they even coordinate all this insane shooting and stuff. He's, I don't know what his brain must be like, but at any rate, he's absolutely brilliant and he runs post for us. And so I presented to him, because he see, they all see before uh, David and Dan and Carolyn see. And um, he goes, yeah, it's not bad. Mm. It's like, we'd like to hear something special, you know, and I'm like, what? Because there was a lot of special stuff in there already, and so I hunted and hunted. He left me alone in the room, and I was a little pissed, I mean, to be honest, because, you know, it's like you kind of get that, Wah. and I started searching, searching, and um, literally I was like, fuck, reptile. <laughs> oh, hey, tortoises, having sex, awesome. Perfect. <laughs> No, it, it's literally kind of, it happened like that in about a period of about half an hour, I started searching and came up, found this, this stuff with these two tortoises fucking, basically, and <laughs> the sound of the male became the purr for Drogon. Do you remember when he comes up in season four and he first lands on the, the, the most prom, it was the first, first use of it, and he lands on the boat, and she's, she's you know, oh, yeah, petting yeah. him, mm -hmm. and he purrs, and every time, I, I would watch people, and they would giggle, and in fact, Greg giggled, and once he giggled, that was it. I was like, wow. I was in, they never, they never asked me to They're have like, to. she gets it, right? Well, they never, <laughs> interesting enough, it's like, I never went to another spotting session, they just give it to me and let me go, and, and. <laughs> once you know at that point. But it's, it's one of those sounds that, it, you know, and again, it has the essence, and that sound has been, has remained, and has stretched, because, I don't know, I didn't mention this before, but okay, so the dragons all have stories for me. And my story with Drogon is that, I mean, that, you know, he's the lead dragon, and her husband was Cal Drogo. So for me, Drogon is her husband reincarnate, and they have, I treat it as a very sexual, sensual relationship. So, like, the scene where they're sitting on the bluffs, and like, it's like I always say that that scene is like Drogon sitting with his lady on the bluff, and then the two brothers come in, who I call Beavis and Butthead, <laughs> you know, ripping the shit a goat, and he's like, get out of here, and you know, you know, like, it's like that. So that's, I, because in some weird way, I'm crafting performances, is what, is what I'm doing, and characters, and, um, anyway, that was a long answer. I'm sorry. Oh, was... <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I mean, let's, should we just skip the rest of the day and just talk to Paula? I think so. <laughs> you have a meet and greet, which everyone should go to. Okay, cool. Everyone yes, should absolutely. go to that if you're interested in, in speaking to her further. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was fast. Very yeah, really fast. This was amazing. Thank you so much for thank hanging you. out. And yeah, thank listen, you. Listen, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your support. And look, enjoy season seven, man. You are going to lose your shit. <laughs>